couple quick announcements. Next week is back to school Sunday. They have a special service in the morning service. Here comes Gavin. Not to be denied. Good job, buddy. Way to go. Uh, special service of prayer and support for the kids. And I'm sort of the pastor will have something for them. On the 25th, we're going to meet again for the Pastor Appreciation Day Committee in that room there. There's some exciting things that are being worked on there. What a great group of people you are. So gifted and so talented. And uh, very creative. So we're really looking forward to that. Pastor Appreciation Day will be the last Sunday. I almost said the last Saturday. I almost made a seven-day Adventist there. For the, <laughs> <laughs> no, the last Saturday. I mean, there you go now. The last Sunday in September. So it's going to be Pastor Appreciation Harvest Home. And we are looking forward to that. But uh, be, be thinking about that, be planning, let us know. We're going to have a sign-up sheet just to get an idea about how many are coming for the dinner so we know approximately how much food that we're going to order. We're going to get food again from Boyers, a turkey dinner like we did last year. It seems to be Pastor Mike Sensen we'll for that for them. We're going to wait on you for the offering today, Mr. Peterman, if you'll come. And uh, John, would you help with the offering today? Yeah. Is this the first time you've ever taken up offering? Yeah. All right, let's celebrate John taking up the offering. Brother <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, will you pray over the offering? We're really so thankful for what you're watching her. We're so thankful for meeting all of her. Amen. Thank God. They don't hold the, 
the, the doctrine and the truth. And sometimes that even slips in among Pentecostal Christians, among evangelicals. People say they believe in God. I like to say to them, what do you believe about God? I believe in Jesus. What do you believe about Jesus? The law is no more. Her prophets also find a vision because there is no law. I uh, was watching an episode not too long ago of Andy Griffith. And Barney and Andy and Aunt B went to church one Sunday. There was a special speaker there, a special minister from New York. And his message was on how to relax, take time to rest. You saw that episode? It had nothing to do with why. Nothing whatsoever. The law is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. What do we believe about the Bible? And there's four things I just want to touch on today rather briefly. First, we believe in the inspiration of the scriptures. We believe the Bible to be inspired of God. We believe the Bible, the Bible does not contain the word of God. The Bible is the word of God big difference. We believe the Bible to be God-breathed. That's what inspiration means. From the mouth of God, from the breath of God, verbally inspired of the Holy Spirit. And we believe both the Old and New Testaments to be inspired of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Last night, I, I don't know what his name is. If I see his face on TV or on the internet, I know he's that the rabbi. There's a very famous rabbi. I don't know his name. But he was debating Dr. Dr. Brown. Uh, I think it was, it's, it's, it's Dr. Brown's first name. Michael Brown. Debating Dr. Michael Brown on if the New Testament was anti-Semitic. And I have news for the good rabbi. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament are inspired of God. They are the revelation of God to man. Jesus and the apostles quoted and preached from the Old Testament. And the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. It might be a new covenant, but they're married together. The Bible, here's, here's something that we should really hang our hat on. We'll, we'll see later why. But the Bible is our all-sufficient, authoritative, final rule of faith and practice. What we do, what we believe, what we practice, our conduct, all must come from the Scriptures. I turned on the car. My daughters used my car yesterday. Two things happen when other people use my car. They move the seat, which is a, a mortal sin. All right? When you're a big guy and you try to get in the car and they herniate you because they got that thing up or up, up this way or up that way, that's a problem. And the other thing is, the radio station has changed. I think it was a Christian station that was on, but I couldn't understand the words. I'm hard of hearing. It's hard for me to understand. But uh, the station wouldn't change. And I quickly changed it to WDAC. And as soon as I heard the preacher, I said to my wife, he's dead. And I meant that he actually had died. He's been dead for a while. James Montgomery Boyce, one of my all-time favorite radio preachers. He was uh, the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. Graduate from the Reformed Episcopal Seminary. And his show, his, I shouldn't say so, but his ministry on the radio was back to the Bible, and his philosophy was he wanted to educate people so that they would think and act biblically. And that's what we want to live. We want to live that we think and act biblically. Paul said to Timothy, and that from a child, 2 Timothy 3.15, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, by the breath of God, by the mouth of God. Every Scripture, every Holy Scripture 
is what it really says in the, in the Greek uh, language there. And is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is what we believe. For reproof. That's something that is kind of lost its way in the church, especially in the Western ministry. And we don't want to go around rebuking people. You have to be very careful. You have to do this in, in love. And uh, there is times when that uh, someone may, may need to step aside from their, their work or ministry for a season in the church because of their lifestyle, right? You see that with ministry. And when we do that, that's our, our discipline should always be punitive and redemptive. Punitive and redemptive. It's good for reproof, for correction. So now you're a little off in that area. Why? Because this is what the Bible says. For instruction in righteousness, how to live a holy life. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the scripture Paul said is it was, it was given by inspiration. God. Peter said, for this prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. I hear people talk, people that Christians go to other churches, maybe they don't go to other churches, but I hear people talk about it. They'll say, yeah, but you know, that was, that was Paul saying that. That was Moses saying that. Well, you know, when I was in Bible school, they taught us about higher criticism, not to believe in it, but just to show you the fallacies. <clears throat> and when we studied the book of Isaiah, Brother Rosen talked to us, he said, how many have read document Q? I didn't see it on the list of books we were supposed to read at the beginning of this course. I'm going to be behind in anything. I didn't raise my hand, thank God, because there is no such thing as document Q. Document Q is a theological belief that that disproves the book of Isaiah and it's taught in seminaries all over the, the world and it says, if there was a document Q, this is what it would say. That's, that's ridiculous. What do the scriptures say? It's not by the will of man, but holy men of God state as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's inspired of God. Uh, Paul said in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. How can the Bible transform and change in life? Because it's God speaking to us. It's God's message and revelation of Himself and His Son and His will of things past, of things present, and things to come. The scriptures are inspired by God. He may use the personalities. Sometimes we can look at a writing and say, well, that's very Paulinian in, in a very light Paul. It's personality to him. But still, they are inspired of God. There's three pillars of the Reformation. And we as Pentecostals, we're Protestant. We're, we are the children of the Reformation. We believe in grace only. We don't believe in karma. We'll talk about that in a moment. We believe in grace only. Faith only. It's not my faith that works. It's, it's not faith plus something else. It's faith only. And we believe in scriptures only. We don't believe, we don't have a separate dogma Say, you know, this is the Bible, it's inspired. But yet, the Bible wasn't sufficient enough. So here's some other rules we're going to lay on you. Paul said to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 2, he said, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Uh, in Colossians, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. <clears throat> this is what happens sometimes. <clears throat> I hear people say, 
Christians. They'll say, uh, well, you know, Gandhi said this, Gandhi said that, Confucius said this, Buddhism says this, Hinduism says that. I have no interest in what they have to say. No interest at all. That's not God's word. That's not God speaking. That's man. <clears throat> a lady one time that I know posted on <clears throat> social media <clears throat> that she hoped karma would come, uh, would come into play in someone's life as a Christian. I, said, I, I don't believe in karma. She asked me why. I said, I believe in grace. I believe in mercy. Karma is you're going to get what you deserve. Jesus talked about grace and mercy. Grace, unmerited favor. God favors me and I didn't earn it. Mercy, I don't get what I deserve. I get better. Thank God. Thank God. You've got to be careful of these philosophies. Sometimes this, this mysticism and, and Eastern uh, philosophies mix into what we believe. I have a friend of mine, thank God she got saved. She posted recently that uh, she was outside and there was a penny on the ground. And there was a dead relative speaking to her that she was they're being with uh, helping them. They didn't. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. And listen, I'm, I'm being quite frank, I know being humorous, but if my dead relatives want to leave some money laying around, they can leave some twenties and fifties and a couple C notes every month. Right? Don't be throwing pennies at me, Mom. You know, I don't need that. <clears throat> Nowhere in the Bible does it say that our relatives who have passed communicate back with us. That is, that is necromancy. That is, that is, it's not right. It's not true. Listen, I don't want the dead relative, even though they're in heaven. I don't want them speaking back to me, they can't, because I have a resurrected Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that speaks to me. Amen. Amen. That's what I want. I don't need a message from beyond. I have relatives that will say to me that when you dream about a dead relative, that's because they came to you in the night. I don't think so. I don't think so. I have family, extended family that says that when you die, I don't know where they get this, but they say when you die, one of the dead relatives comes to get you. We will see family in heaven, no doubt. But I'll tell you what, that moment that I pass from this life to the next, I want to see Jesus. I want to walk into the arms of a Savior who stretched out his hands and died for me on power. That, that's what will be amazing about heaven. When we come up with some of these some of these things, you know, it's not biblical. Sometimes we have practices and and some in some Christian circles, you know, I, but the third church I pastored was an independent Bible church. And some of them had come out of some <clears throat> mainline denominations. And they were great people, wonderful people. Some of them came to me the first Easter season I was there. And they questioned me about Lent. Are you going to be celebrating Lent? What are you going to be doing for Lent? And I simply said, well, you know, I don't see anything in the Bible about Lent. They said, what do you mean? There's nothing in the Bible about Lent. You know what they said? Okay. You know, people come to me at times and they'll say, you're against this and that that's in my life. I never say, oh, yes, I am. I never do that. You know what I say? Well, let's, let's look and see what the Scripture says. Jesus said that to the Pharisees that they made the Word of God of no effect through their tradition, which He had delivered. And they said many such things you do because they practice certain rituals and washing their hands and cleansing the pots. He answered, and he, Jesus answered at one time, he woke to the to saying, he said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And what he was saying is, man doesn't live by just one slice of bread, but by the whole loaf. He can't live by one slice of bread. He can't live by the whole counsel of God. And we have to ask ourselves, 
Where am I living? Is my life lining up with God's word? What do the scriptures say? In any question of conduct or faith practice, we simply have to say, what do the scriptures say? Why do we care what the scriptures say? Because they are inspired You want to know the will of God? Read the Bible. You want to know what, what direction to go? What path you should go? Read the Word of God. Read the Bible. He speaks to us. Everything gets, gets, uh, gets critiqued by the Word of God because the Word of God it, it, it's a criteria by which we judge and make judgments upon things in life. We're not to believe every spirit. But we are to try the spirits, whether they be of God or not. How do we know if they're of God or not? By the scripture. One man can't say Jesus is a Christ and at the same time say that he is Maranatha, that he's a curse. That's of the spirit of God. What does Jesus say? What does the Bible say? So we know first that the scripture is inspired of God. We also believe in two other things. The infallibility and the inerrancy of Scripture. The infallibility simply means this. God's Word will never pass away and never become outdated. Never. Oh, well, that was back in the old times. That, that was in a different age. That was in a different era. Era. Listen, there are some things in the Old Testament that have been fulfilled in Christ. But we don't have animal sacrifice doesn't mean it's not God's word. It paints a picture of the things future. Every time I talk about the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is still relevant today, there's always someone that brings this up to me. That a, that a rebellious child is to be stoned. It says that in the Old Testament. Should we be stoning them? No. The scripture, we moved into a new covenant of grace and mercy, and God is giving them what? Space to repent. But the message is this, that a rebellious child, an insolent child who doesn't change, is destined for judgment. Not in my hands, but in the hands of God. My mother used to quote, you know, some people believe it. I had a lady in one of my churches going back to me. lady in one of my churches said one time, I was out on visitation. She went to church, her daughter's family, and quite a large family in the church, and she said to me, she said, you know, I lived in a previous life. How can I live? I said, this is what the Bible says. My mother used to always quote this. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then what? The judgment. So, God's word never becomes outdated. It's a, it, it never be, it'll never pass away. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus lived 2,000 years ago today, but his words are still relevant to me. Today, do you know why? Because he still lives today. Peter said, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this word, which by the gospel is preached unto you, so when we talk about the infallibility of the scriptures, what we're saying is the Bible is completely trustworthy. It's completely trustworthy. If it says it in here, it's true. Thy word, O Lord, is true. Infallibility means incapable of making a mistake. It's truthful without any defect. And part of the doctrine of the Scriptures being infallible means that it's also inerrant. Now there are people who believe, and this is, I don't know how they do this, but there is a, 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 a train of thought in, taught in seminaries and, and among some theologians that yes, God's word is infallible, but it's not inerrant. But we don't believe that. If you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, you believe in the infallibility, but some people believe that it's, that it's still, it's, it's whatever, but this is what they say is, it's infallible in as much as it's not part of the Bible that's a mistake. We don't believe there's a mistake. We do not believe that there are errors in the Scripture. Inerrancy deals with the details of Scriptures, whereas infallibility is broader in concept. 
The Word of God is truthful. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. And the psalmist, David, 119, verse 160, Thy Word is true from the beginning. What do you mean by beginning? From the beginning of time. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. In Revelation, we read, And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it. And it says, And I saw the dead, both small and great. And what does it go on to say? And he judged them out of the books. I think one of the books is the Bible. I think the other book could be, be the Lamb's Book of Life, the fact that they're not in there, or it could be the book of their deeds. But the criteria that we're judged by is by the Word of God. It is true. It is inherent. And we, when, we, when we live our lives outside of the Scripture, we diminish, really, what we think about the inerrancy, the infallibility, and the inspiration of God's Word. And then there's the importance of Scripture. Why is the Bible so important? Why is studying and, and learning and reading and listening to the Word, why is that so important? It enhances spiritual growth and it builds faith. This morning, I listened to Justin pray. As he was praying over the option. <clears throat> and always listen to what people are praying because it's very possible that one of the gifts of the Spirit is the word, word of faith. And leave for, for a few moments out of his hearing the word of faith coming out of his mouth. Where does that word of faith spring from? It springs from the word of God hid in the heart of a believer. Peter, 1 Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Paul said, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know what you do for someone that's sick in the hospital or bedridden or in a nursing home? Just read God's words. We had a family that went to one of our churches and uh, came occasionally. They lived in a farm back the road from the church. And the mother said, I married the, their son and then I married their daughter. One week was the son's wedding, the next week was the daughter's wedding. Would you like to be that if you were the dad? Have that family and have that? That was quite a thing. And I want to tell you, they had a beautiful pond and a beautiful pavilion. And both of those Saturdays, they were loaded with people. They got people from all over. County officials and some of them. But they had Grandma living there in the farm. And she was not doing very well at all. She said to me one Sunday, Pastor, will you come visit my mother? So I went out there and she was in a back bedroom off of the kitchen of the farmhouse. And she said, now listen, she said, mom doesn't talk much. She probably won't say anything. She'll respond, she's awake, she's alert, she'll talk, she just doesn't talk. She said, they just want to, you know, in case you try to engage her in a conversation. So I went in and I sat beside her bed and I introduced myself to her. I said, can I read the Bible to you? So I read Psalm 40. I read the, my favorite song, Hear My Cry of God, He Heaven My Prayer for Me, as I hear the light crying of Thee, but my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I read Isaiah, I read the book of Isaiah, I went back to Psalms, I read a little bit from the New Testament. I was there about 45 minutes, and she was taking it in, she was smiling. A little bit of a whisper. The next Sunday, her daughter said to me, she said, I don't know what we're going back there with you and mom. She 
He said, well, for the first time in months, she ate her dinner at the dinner table that night. And she said, we could shut her off. She talked about all the scriptures that you read. Listen, it wasn't me. It was God's word working in her. It nourishes the soul. It encourages the spirit. God was working in her. It was building faith and bringing spiritual growth to her. You want to grow in God? You want to go beyond where you are now? Read the Bible. You can say to me, I don't understand. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't have a problem either reading it. An English translation that's easier for you to understand. I don't have a problem with you listening to the Bible. It's so easy to only listen to the scripture. They got that one guy that's on the one Christian radio station they play on. Hey, what's his name? I don't know, but he's he is a very deep movie to me. But hey, listen to it. Teach the children the scriptures. Read the Bible to your children. You don't have to read all. You don't have to sit down and read Psalm 119 all hundred and some verses to your child in one night. Now get a little bit in there. Talk a little bit about Jesus. Give a little bit of the Bible. But that constant exposure to the Scripture causes one to grow and to mature spiritually. It's when we stop reading the Bible. It's when we stop giving ourselves to teaching. Remember what Paul said to Timothy? He said to uh, he said, Give yourself to study and to teach sound doctrine. The Bible is a guide and a light. You know what the psalm says again, 119 psalm, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It helps me to know where to step and it makes sure that I'm heading down the right path and not the wrong path. The world's a very dark and, and scary place. I don't want to make any missteps. What did the psalmist say? Uh, the 23rd Psalm, lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I don't want to make a wrong turn. Here, here that way. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do in this situation. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. It's easy when you don't know what you're supposed to say. You know what you do? You don't say anything. Never has anyone ever set me down and said, listen, your silence has really messed things up. Now, it's possible, but it's, not, it's the things I say, it's the things that come out of this mouth that get me into trouble. But sometimes I'm not sure what direction I can go. I'm not sure that I'm stepping on sure ground. And I tell you, and I don't want to get in trouble, but I'm going to get in trouble for the same Pray for me after I say this, okay? You know what the funniest sound in the world is? My wife tripping over the cat in our kitchen at 4 o'clock. <laughs> it's dark. She can't see the cat, and the animals constantly are under her feet. The dogs are constantly at me. I don't know what it's like not to eat without a dog staring me in the face. Or sleep with one. What's that? Or sleep with one. Or sleep with one. When Kitty leaves for work in the morning, I pray to God I don't die in my sleep at the car or find me in bed with two hundred pound dogs. Because that's what it is. It's amazing. Sometimes it's dark and we can't see where we're walking. Turn to the scriptures. Turn to the scriptures. It's bread to our soul. Job did not have a Bible, but he had the words of God. God was speaking his words to him. This is what Job said. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. If you were to say to Job, you like that lunch or would you like to hear what God has to say? You would have said, I want to hear what God has to say first. I need that. It's bread to my soul. Someone said that evangel evangelism is simply this. One beggar telling another beggar 
where he found bread. And we find bread in the Word of God. It is a fire, my, my final point, it's a fire that convicts. Give people your opinion. Just give them a word of God. But it's so emotionally wrapped up in it. Can I tell you about a guy from King Challenge all the time? If I say this, please don't be offended. But this is what he said makes sense. He said, don't beat the hell out of people with the Bible. What he was saying is that people have the devil and sin, but we don't beat that out of them with the Bible. So the Bible speak for itself. Jeremiah said, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? When God begins to convict through his word, there's a burning that begins to happen inside. There's a hammer that begins to break away at that which should be there. Some people need to be broken in order to be made better. Brokenness is healed by more brokenness. God is nigh in them that have a broken heart, a contrite spirit. And how does that happen? It happens because the Word begins to work mightily inside a person. We want to be a church that stands in the Word of God. We want to be a church, we have a pastor that preaches the Word of God. He's not up here talking about Confucius. He's not up here talking about Nishi or somebody else. He's preaching the Word of God. We're in the church that teaches the Word of God. We're not going to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We want to practice and let our lives be lived through what the scriptures say. If our lives are, are out of line, then we want to pray that God will help us to bring them into alignment with the scriptures. Philip Bliss wrote a hymn. The first line, of course, goes like this. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words. Wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. Beautiful words. Wonderful words. Wonderful words. That song's been ringing in my heart. Say, if you come to the piano, please. But the song's been ringing in my heart for days. Another song, a hymn that's been ringing in my heart this week, threw my back out, was uh, He is Able to Deliver. Though by sin press come to Him for us, our God is able to deliver. He begins to speak the scripture. Sometimes God will speak just part of the scripture to me. And I believe it's because he wants me to go dig and find it. But speak a word. God never speaks apart from his word. Never. Because his word, his word works mightily in us. We believe this to be what? The inspired word. We believe it to be infallible, in error. We believe it to be important for our spiritual growth and development. I would rather be in a room with three or four people discussing God's Word than to sit in the great halls of education and contemplating the philosophies of dead people. Last night I caught a few minutes Carl Sagan, the old tonight show. Carl's no longer on the sun. Boy, did he get so much wrong. So mystified with what's way out there in the universe that he never caught a glimpse of the one who created the universe. Never saw the grandeur, the beauties, and the wonders of God's Word. People say, well, the Bible doesn't address this. Then. Where the Bible is silent, I remain silent. I don't have the answers for everything. When I think of the vastness and greatness of God, I say to people, when you get to the end of the universe, what's out there? For you? Other gods? 
Carl Sagan so much wanted to be able to communicate with, with other intelligent life that was maybe 24 light years, he was talking last night about 24 light years away, or even a, a million light years away. You know what? I communicate with him and created all of them. I always get it all right. And I, I'll tell you what, he is all and all, and his word is all and all. Let's commit ourselves to following what the scripture says. Let's help teach others, others in our church, others that we come in contact with, with our family. Just simply in a very calm and loving way at times say, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? I used to be offended at those, uh, what were those WWJD, what would Jesus do? It was my first time I laughed at Probably because it challenged me. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? He's our great example. He's our Savior. Do you believe God's Word? God's Word, God's Word only. Will you stand with me today? I'm going to invite you to come to the altar here in a few moments. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love and we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your Son in these last days. We thank you you have revealed yourself to us through the Scriptures. We believe that this is God's Word and we thank you for it. We believe it's infallible, that it stands the test of time, that your Word is eternal, that your Word is truthful. We believe that it's inerrant. We see the importance of God's word for our lives. Father, we give our hearts to you again, a new and a fresh day, to live and to think and to act biblically in Jesus' name. Take some time today. Like, come, come around the altar. Just spend some time contemplating your life and God's word. Let the Lord speak to your heart.